Good evening to everyone who's joining us tonight on the uh, last in our lecture series in terms of recovering from the COVID period. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ilan Chaitovitz and Marcel and Joel and the uh, South Hampstead Tool Office thought I'd be a, a good compare for tonight's uh, talks because I have a financial and healthcare background as well as being a long-standing member of the community. And as you'll see, um, those three things play very nicely into this evening's topics. So just a quick reminder to those again who are online, please mute your Zoom uh, buttons and please feel free to put your questions on the group chat. There will be time allocated at the end of the presentations to go through all of them and we will uh, uh, field as many of those as we can to, to our guest speakers. So without further ado, uh, it's my great honor and privilege to be able to introduce the Paperweight Trust. Uh, it's an 11 year old trust that is quite amazing in terms of its remit. Uh, it's a wonderful charity that provides both confidential and free expert support on a wide range of matters spanning legal, financial and welfare issues for those in need during the, some of life's most stressful times. So the last 18 months have been difficult for all of us. Um, for those not directly impacted by the pandemic and the virus itself, there have certainly been financial and emotional ramifications that have hit all of us uh, and are still hitting us and are likely to have long lasting consequences. And it's those last two things in particular, which is really what uh, Paperweight is focusing on. And to their credit, over the last decade or so, they've dealt with thousands of issues relating to people's mental health and people's finances and employment and amongst a whole range of other things, I'm not going to steal their thunder. And they have, for the most part, resulted in good outcomes for the vast majority of the people who approach them. And that's really the purpose of this evening is to um, educate us as to what they can do and hopefully provide a helping hand to those who reach out to them. So I'd like to um, first introduce the, the two speakers and they can uh, carry on themselves. Firstly, Caroline Kahan is Director of Services and has extensive legal training that she's put to excellent use in the advice sector over the past two decades. Then we're going to hear from Eve Curtis, who's the Operations Manager and a practicing social worker. She helps children and adults and is well versed across the spectrum of mental health support in the workplace. On that note, Caroline, can I hand it over to you, please? Hello, everyone. Good evening. And thank you very much for this opportunity to present to the community this evening. I hope it will be informative. Um, by way of introduction, although Ilan has already <laughs> stolen my thunder in that <laughs> point, <laughs> um, I am Caroline Kahan, and um, my background is a legal one. I'm going to start sharing my screen, actually. My background is a legal one, and I have worked at Citizens Advice for the last 20 years and other small voluntary sector organizations, all of which specialize in advice and information. Prior to that, I did law at university and up to master's level and taught some contract law at university. So that's my bit. And now over to Eve Curtis, my colleague. Thank you. Um, so I'm Eve. Um, I'm a qualified social worker. I've worked with children and families and also adults of working age and older adults. I have a statutory and voluntary experience. I've worked with children and families in um, schools with, uh, that support people with additional needs. And I've also worked in the care management, safeguarding and older adult teams of some a few local authorities. 
Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so now I'm going to start. I've got a, a sort of a, a short PowerPoint presentation, um, which I hope will be helpful and it will be a point of reference um, throughout this brief talk. I am only going to talk briefly because there's nothing more boring than listening to someone drone on and I'm sure that you will have questions at the end, so please do save them up. Okay, let's just hope it works. Oh dear, that's not good, is it? Oh. Okay, so let's get past that one. And I'm now going to just play a brief. I was in the middle of a divorce and it turned nasty. I was alone with our three children and my youngest son is autistic. I was completely lost. My husband always looked after the finances. I didn't know what to do. He hadn't paid the last month's bills and our landlord was threatening to evict me. I knew nothing about benefits. I was broke, debts were mounting up and then after suffering headaches, I'd been told I had degenerative eye disease. I was going blind. I didn't know what to do. I was terrified. I felt overwhelmed by how much money we owed. I was terrified at my own medical diagnosis and didn't know how to get treatment. I felt that my head would explode. Each time I heard the postman, I panicked that it was another bill I couldn't pay. I literally couldn't see a way out. That's when I was told about paperweight. I rang them up and they arranged for a caseworker, Robert, to call me. I would have been lost without him. He guided me through the family courts, the tribunals, to secure specialised support for my son. He liaised with the banks to ensure we didn't lose the house, sorted out everything, the council payments, the benefits, the court applications. He helped me access specialist support for my sight so that daily tasks are no longer a challenge. Now, I sleep at night. My kids sleep at night. My son is doing so much better. I'm becoming more independent. I'm no longer embarrassed to ask for help. I know where to go if I need it. And I could not have done this, would not be where I am today without paperweight. So now if we move on to another case study, it's a, this is actually a client that um, let me help to support quite recently. He's 78 years old and lives alone. His wife died six years ago. In February this year, he approached us because his council tax um, reduction had stopped in December 2020. He told us that the council tax department at the local authority had contacted him in October 2020 and asked him for further financial information. But he hadn't responded because he had great difficulty using IT. And the pandemic as well. Um, he was shielding, he was isolated, he had no support. Um, and the result was that his benefits stopped and he was faced with a large bill for council tax that he couldn't afford. When he contacted us, we took his authorization to act on his behalf and our caseworker immediately wrote to the local authority, stressing that Harry had been eligible throughout 
giving all the reasons for his failure to respond in a timely fashion. After several weeks, and it really was several weeks, the council finally responded to say that Harry was out of time, unfortunately, and would need to reapply. We helped him to do that, but we also asked for a reconsideration of the council's decision, attaching all the necessary financial evidence. Fortunately for Harry and for us, the reconsideration was successful and the council agreed to backdate the award to December 2020. In total, the cash success secured on the client's behalf amounted to £2,400. He was absolutely delighted, so relieved. It really was an excellent result. So what is Paperweight? We're a voluntary sector charity, which offers free tailored guidance as opposed to legal advice, information and general support to all members of the Jewish community across the UK, whether they're affiliated, unaffiliated, however orthodox or non-orthodox, anyone who's Jewish can use our services. We are impartial, non-judgmental, confidential, and most of all, always empathetic. Always there with warmth and empathy. We really do care about our clients. So our guidance extends to many, many areas, but just to mention some of them, debt, which as I think we can all imagine is a huge area. Budgeting, maybe making, helping people to make sure that they're managing their money effectively. Benefits, housing, relationship breakdown, including quite a lot of domestic abuse. LPAs and deputyships, navigating the care system, and help with all manner of paperwork. We were established in 2010, so we've been going for 11 years. Um, we were established basically to provide support and practical help to people who'd lost a partner, either through death or divorce. Um, it fulfilled a need in the community because there were a lot of people who sort of were so overcome by their uh, loss that they were unable to move forward. And there were also a lot of people who perhaps hadn't been used to dealing with paperwork and finances before the loss of their partner. And it was based on a home visiting model, caseworkers would go to clients' homes, sit with them, listen to them, look through their papers, help them sort out their papers and do anything else to help them get on top of the immediate aftermath and get into some sort of an order. But we've grown and we've developed and now we support more than a hundred new clients a month, often with multiple complex issues, all of which are interwoven. So we find that people come to us with rent arrears, which is obviously a priority debt. They come to us with this because they've had a problem with their housing benefit, their universal credit housing costs and that's caused the debt, but the problem has lain with the fact that they've forgotten to inform the DWP of a change in their circumstances and their benefits have stopped and they fail to appeal within the time frame. And that this leads to anxiety, depression. So the nature of advice is that it is all inextricably Interlinked, and when you think you're dealing with one issue, you're very often dealing with a multiplicity of issues. How do we do it? Well, we have a helpline which is staffed throughout the week by volunteer assessors. We have a hundred plus volunteer caseworkers. We match up 
our inquiries to the skills and expertise of the caseworker. So every uh, two or three days, Eve and I go through all the cases that have come in and we allocate cases to caseworkers based on the nature of the inquiry, the client's support needs and the skills and expertise of the caseworker. Clients are at the moment seen wholly remotely. Prior to this, we were offering home visits, but the pandemic has really put pay to that. We were hoping that we may be able to resume some face-to-face -face interactions after the 21st of June, but I think at the moment it's all very tenuous and we are seeing an upsurge in, um, in the virus, unfortunately. So, um, Prior to the pandemic, we were offering home visits or perhaps office meetings in London, Manchester or Gateshead, where we have three um, offices. So we've got a main, our main office is in London and we have an outreach office in Manchester and one in Gateshead. Although at the moment, it really doesn't matter where you are or where we are, because we are able to help as many people as we possibly can remotely. And we are offering that support via telephone, email, FaceTime, Zoom. However, whatever is best, the best fit for the client. If clients don't have access to the internet, and some of our clients don't, then we get them to post copies of their paperwork, which somebody goes into the office every couple of days, scans and emails it off to the relevant caseworker and we then telephone once we've got that paperwork. So we are managing, it's often difficult, it's not perfect for everyone, but we've had no choice. So this is very briefly our workflow. Somebody calls up and a very holistic assessment is taken with as much factual detail as possible. The case gets sent to allocation, we select a caseworker, caseworker makes contact for an initial conversation and arranges the next substantive meeting and carries out casework until the end of the case. That could be one interaction, it could be 10 interactions, it really depends on the nature of the inquiry. At the end, the case is closed and feedback form is sent to the client so that we know how they feel about our service, how they rate it. And our people, we've got a trustee board. We've got now four paid staff. Up until uh, 2018, we had no paid staff. Um, and then in 2018, they recruited an operations manager who actually is no longer there, but we've sort of replaced that, that post. So we now have four paid members of staff. We have a CEO. We have um, my, my position, we have Eve's position, and we have somebody who does our marketing and communication on a part-time basis. We have 12 volunteer assessors, two volunteer administrators, volunteer software developer, and six volunteer IT trainers. We have just launched a new CRM, and uh, that in itself has been <laughs> A big piece of work so an ongoing piece of work caroline sorry is i just wondered whether it'd be um uh useful to explain some of the backgrounds of our um volunteers as well our, our case workers um there we have um a variety of of kind of of case workers who are skilled in different areas so some of are still employed some are retired solicitors, we have people who are um, were employment judges, um, we have caseworkers who are very um, knowledgeable in the area of lasting power of attorneys and deputyships. So for m all of the, the inquiries that we have, mostly all of the inquiries, um, we have a volunteer who has experience, whether it's from employment um, or, or kind of training, they have experience in the, in the area of um, of need. We also have um, caseworkers who are very skilled in the area of housing. They run businesses as well, so are able to provide some mentoring in terms of um, if, if um, or mentoring or advocacy 
in the area of um, liaising with different organisations and local authorities and councils. Hey, thank you. I think that is helpful. So you can see that, you know, we have multiple skills on board and it's really a question of matching that up uh, with the client's needs. Um, going forward, we know that we're going to have to retain a robust remote service, um, never more so than before. We are hoping to be able to retain face to face for people who are vulnerable and who have no other way of taking advice when where that is an evolving picture at the moment and it's really hard to plan we have seen already an exponential growth in client numbers and we expect to see even more because i i think there are a lot of people who haven't actually felt the effects of the pandemic yet in terms of they're still furlough albeit it's reducing now uh, the stay on evictions has ended, universal credit will drop by £1,000 at the end of September. So there are a lot of people still to be affected. Um, the problems are increasingly complex and interwoven. Uh, we've already started to see evictions. I mean, the stay on evictions only ended uh, very recently and basically we're already seeing an uplift in the numbers of eviction and huge numbers of benefit claimants, huge. Um, and we are going to have to train, keep training and developing our current caseworkers, our new caseworkers um, and recruit people all the time to keep um, in line with the demand for our services. So this is my sales pitch now. For people who want intellectual challenge, an opportunity to use their professional skills in a community setting, meet like-minded individuals, albeit remotely at the moment, benefit from regular training, work hopefully at some stage face to face albeit remotely at the moment and help some of the most vulnerable people in the community and, and also it's in addition to thinking about people who are vulnerable it's about thinking about supporting people who are in vulnerable situations so any of us who go through a kind of a life event or 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 change in our circumstances that can mean that at some time we need a bit of support to, to help us get through or face a particular challenge that we're dealing that we're facing, whether it be a housing issue or uh, um, a decrease in our income or a loss of employment, bereavement, and there's a change of role or being a carer for, for a family member or person who's unwell and having to kind of understand a completely new system whether it be the care system or not, there will be many times in, in any of our lives where we might need a bit of extra support. So that, that's where we, we come into, into play as well. Um, Very much so, because we're all vulnerable at different times. So, uh, Caroline, Eve, it just, it's a very good time for me to uh, put in a cheeky question. Um, it, it seems that a lot of the people that you're speaking to are going to have serious life issues that they're contending with but those are going to be compounded by real emotional turbulence and emotional needs as well that probably also need to be addressed at the same time and sometimes in life it's not obvious where one starts and where the other finishes and as i was wondering for instance if someone were bereaved and they had an issue with their finances they might need both bereavement counseling and financial assistance and how do you manage those different pragmatic versus emotional um, uh, needs of the people that you're, that you're helping? That's a really good question. That is a really good question. Do you want to start with that, Eve? Yeah, yeah. Um, so where possible, we try and minimise the number of caseworkers supporting just so that the relationship between the client and caseworker can build and develop. And we feel that that would be better support for, for the client. Um, and it's possible with some things where there might be a housing issue or benefit. Sometimes the reason why a caseworker is uh, approaching us for some support are areas such as, I don't know, finance um, and something can 
completely different and we need to have two different caseworkers. Um, sometimes it can be more. It may be that uh, it's best to take a task-centered approach. So deal with the most pressing problem at, or pressing issue or need first, and then to address the other, one, the other um, support requirements um, with another caseworker. Or it may be that having a team around the caseworker would be helpful so that they're both working on, the case, two caseworkers are working on separate issues at the same time, but liaising so one knows what the other one is doing. Um, so it really depends. It's personalised to the client um, and we always look at um, you know, what the client's needs are and how we can best support. So there isn't a one set approach. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I would just add to that, that um, certainly when you're talking about loss post bereavement, it's very often a series of interactions rather than just one, because it may be that initially a client is not perhaps well placed to deal with it and they just need to let their emotions out. Um, and we just do it very gradually, step by step. And what we try to do it, with their permission is to follow them up. Once the substantive ask for help has been managed, we try to follow them up, you know, maybe six, eight weeks later to see if there's something else because people in that position, that situation may not know at that point in time exactly what they need the help with. So um, you're right to say that there are times when you know where people's emotions come into it. In fact, in all, on all occasions, people's emotions come in, into it because the people who come to us are the people who have problems. But um, I have to say that in terms of empathy and supportive approach and practicality, as well as guidance and information, we, we are, quite good at that and having worked in sort of other organizations I can see you know the, the difference in the warmth and empathy of our service so carrying on with my with my uh, recruitment plug um, we're seeking volunteers particularly with an up-to-date working knowledge in housing benefits debt budgeting family law good understanding of the care system and experience supporting people with mental health issues. We see a lot of people with mental health issues and expect to see a lot more because, you know, we are all impacted in one way or another by this pandemic. So um, those are the sort of skills that we, we are looking for at the moment. Um, in addition, you will need and you will also be trained in effective communication skills and ability to explain often complex information to clients and make sure they've understood it. You need to be IT literate. Um, an ordered approach to casework and an ability to work, follow and develop agreed procedures. Understanding of the need to be impartial, non-judgmental and confidential and a warm, empathetic um, manner and making sure that the client is the, at the centre of everything we do. So please do sign up if you have those skills. We're looking for you, we're waiting for you. And in addition, please, note what we can help people with either you your family members your friends people in the community people in the wider community you know you are the people that we are there to help so please take that help when you need it and thank you for listening to us this evening thank you Yeah. There's any questions? <laughs> uh, uh, is uh, sorry. Is he uh, is he going to um, say something separate, or, or we're going to go straight to Q and A, Caroline? No, I think we'll go straight to Q and A, and and he will take the questions that oh, are yeah. more appropriate. Okay. I'll stop um, sharing. Okay, great. Um, I think I, I guess I wanted to add actually, if there isn't a question yet. I mean, sometimes people are not sure whether it is a. Um, whether their, their situation is something that we can help with. 
and um you know we'll always i, I would uh, um emphasize that don't don't let that be a reason to kind of not contact us contact us we have um excellent people who answer the phones and we'll be able to provide um some some take the information needed and we'll always try and find out how we can help somebody even if it's not us we'll you know put some we'll let the client know um who's best place to support you know we also do signposting and we are very knowledgeable of the different services in the jewish community as well um, just on that note, Eve, um, thank you for that. Uh, do you are you guys open to to youngsters helping out or getting involved? Is um, I know at university there was something called crisis link line. Uh, wasn't quite uh, as um, uh, amazing as what you guys are doing, but it was a sort of toe in in the right place. Do you do anything like that? Well, we help anyone who basically we help adults. We don't help. We help the parents of minors. So, if, for example, we help parents with applications for DLA for their child, um, but we don't actually support or we haven't so far supported anyone who is a minor. Um, whether or not we would. It, I think we could offer them volunteering opportunities in administration, but not in the substantive casework. No. We we have some um, we have some volunteers who are still at university. Some are studying kind of law degrees, um, and we we kind of get we get lots of kind of requests for help. Um, you know helping completing applications um online for various different things um and we'll you know we'll always welcome anybody who wants to kind of volunteer for us but our our main request for support are the areas that caroline mentioned which are kind of housing benefits employment issues and, and increasing numbers of people asking about um the care system and and how that works as well and their rights yeah Thank you. Well, if anybody wants to ask any questions, now's a good time to, to post them on the on the group chat. Uh, we've actually had a few come in to me um, in advance of this, and I'll, I'll just field um, a handful of those if whilst we're waiting for, for anyone who wants to uh, to raise anything. Um, the first actually is quite interesting. I, I'd love to know the answer to this is, is if you say to your bank, um, I don't want, you know, I can't afford to pay my mortgage now or your car finance company, I, I need a, a payment holiday. Does that, does that actually go on your, 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 your credit rating? And, and if it does, what's the impact or how do you get it off? How, how does that all, that dynamic play out? Um, there's quite, uh, yeah, credit rating is a very big area and is one actually that we're giving a series of talks on. Um, basically, what I would say is, in a, in a nutshell, is if you are faced with difficulty making meeting a repayment, the very first thing you need to do is contact the creditor. Do not sit on it. Do not, you know, whatever you do, contact them. Say, look, I've got some temporary difficulties due to X, Y, and Z. Is there a possibility of negotiating the problem? The reason that most people get into debt and get poor credit re reference ratings is because they don't communicate, they don't open their post, they don't deal with it immediately in a timely way. It is always better to go and see if you can get a better, uh, you know, you can negotiate a payment holiday or reduce payments according to your circumstances, et cetera, et cetera, a payment plan. If you leave it, you will run into problems. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of our clients, often through no fault of their own, uh, do leave it a long time. And yes, it will impact on your credit rating. Thank you. Um, and this is actually one of mine, and it's um, it's a slightly odd question. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm going to phrase it properly, but I, I had a, a friend, one of my closest friends at university, who's a bit of a rock, really incredibly affable, warm stable person um, through, you know, throughout most of the year. And actually over the last few months, she's had a really, really tough time. And I was talking to her about it. And she said to me, which I've never thought about this, was that people with um, 
uh, mental health issues are used to uh, managing adverse conditions in their in their psyche and they, it's part of their slings and arrows and it's part of their um, their environment their milieu on a day-to-day -day basis and, and actually it's the regular people it's the other 60% um, of the population or whatever it is uh, who during COVID it's such a curveball that they haven't actually had the strategies to to deal with it uh, and maybe there's there's been a much wider broadening of these issues than you might think for the typical sensitive subpopulations. It's a long-winded question, but I was just wondering, have you seen a much wider um, remit, a much you know, broader carnage in terms of the, the COVID than one might have expected, just given where the sensitive populations are? We have seen an uplift in the numbers of people experiencing mental health problems uh, that are a lot of problems that we see have been COVID related. We tend to see the substantive issues, but underlying we are dealing with people who are suffering with poor mental health, perhaps they're depressed, they're anxious, um, they, they don't know how best to deal with their situation, they've never been in debt before, they've certainly never had to turn universal credit before, um, it is a whole new ball game, and yes, I, you know, you, you kind of lose your your notion of yourself as well uh, in these very difficult circumstances. So yes, I think the answer is that you know what what's good mental health and what's normal, because you know we're all on a, a sliding spectrum, so to speak. It's a question of the fact that some people get pushed over the brink at certain points in their life we probably all do by different stresses and this the pandemic has been a stressor for many many people and we know that because you only just have to turn on the radio the television there's a lot more awareness of mental health i'd like to add to that as well i mean um you know mental health is is should be considered in the same way as physical health i mean we've all got physical health we've all got mental health is still one of uh, the areas of health that um, actually have, has a lot of stigma um, attached to it. And in, in terms of resilience, it's, you know, resilience is something that is, is a learned thing. We, we can um, become more resilient when we have um, more support and the tools available to us. And I suppose that's where paperweight comes in as well, is that we can be that support for people when they need it. Um, and I think one of the things that's really, um, uh, kind of struck me throughout the pandemic is is the isolation where people had lots of people kind of going in to, to their home and helping them out. People are more isolated than ever. Um, and also cuts to local authority, you know, the local authorities are having to kind of deal with high, larger and larger numbers of people who need support, um, the most priority and urgent needs are being um, help people are being helped first and then people who have kind of lower level support needs are, are, are kind of uh, left until their needs become a bit more of a crisis so we do kind of um fill the gap in that respect and in in certain areas um but i think the isolation was a, a big thing that kind of came to mind when you were asking your question thank you thanks Eve. yeah i mean just um just loneliness people are, are being really lonely um exactly. it's amazing to me how at a time when the world has never been more connected than ever before, uh, people can be lonely. That's a, that's a bit of irony. Uh, just a couple more questions. Um, there's still opportunities for anyone who wants to put something on the group chat, um, but uh, these are a bit more um, pragmatic or practical. Um, the first is uh, a question about uh, top up of estate pension contributions. And um, how can you do that if you've been out of work for a while? It, it, well, it depends if you've, uh, you can actually retrospectively top up your contributions, or if you sign on, you will be accredited with national uh, insurance contributions. That's the other thing. If you lose a job and you sign on, you should be, you will be accredited with national insurance contributions while you are claiming, but then you will have, you know, uh, claim and commitments you will need certainly with universal credit to look for work to be actively looking for work 35 hours a week etc cetera, etc cetera. 
Um, pensions is a very big topic. I, I, and I am no expert. People have a lot of expertise, but it is obviously pension uh, top ups and things like that are is an area that we can support you with. Although obviously pensions advice is regulated, so that's a, that's a different area. But certainly with making sure that you've made the right contributions and looking into why you believe you're getting less than you should be getting is something that we can certainly help with. Yeah. I thank you. I mean, uh, there's there's one more question, but you you just raised something which has been an undercurrent um, throughout this evening's discussion. And for me, I'd, be, I'd love to know how you guys walk the fine line between what is qualified um, regulatory ring fenced advice and what is um, informal, warm. Um, friendly helping hand sort of stuff and how do you delineate that how do you um, adjudicate that with your clients and the people that you're talking to it, it seems quite a fraught activity to be engaged in um, and risky for the charity actually never mind the people that you you're trying to help yeah I, I have to say it is a very fine dividing line I think what I would probably say is that guidance is information that is available in the public domain to all but you need to know where to find it and then apply it appropriately to your personal situation and i'd say that that's what we do more than anything um we find the right information we apply it to the person's situation but if it is something that requires legal advice with a solicitor or it is something that requires uh, regulated advice like investment or pensions for which you need to be regulated, we will direct you. We have uh, resources di to direct you. We have people that we can um, you know, give you options for, but uh, we won't do that ourselves. But it can be a very difficult line very difficult just something to add to that as well um i mean when we talk about information that's publicly available one might think you know i could just go in and uh, understand the information myself or search myself and for many people you know that would be the case but also having the the background knowledge and experience in those specific areas allows one to have a, a, a better understanding of the information that's there for instance just thinking about um, uh, social services and the processes and the financial assessments that uh, are involved in when someone needs some support from the local authority with care, having a look at the different websites and un trying to understand the information is really sometimes very complex. Um, and our volunteers in the different areas of housing and uh, pensions, etc., will have um, their experience and knowledge base allows them to kind of understand the information and be able to relay that and communicate that in a way that the person would better understand it than if they were to read it themselves. That, that's very true and I should also say that benefits are one of our largest areas that is not regulated but it's incredibly complex and it all fits together like a jigsaw puzzle you don't want to get it wrong um, so it's really important to make the right decisions and to claim the right benefits to take that that guidance um, at the beginning. Great. Thank you. Well, that's a, it's a wonderful segue into the last um, uh, last question from me that we had before was uh, landlord disputes, and um, that's a legally fraught area. How do you guys how do you guys help on that front? Well, we help with private tenancies. So um, we will give um, information and guidance, tailored guidance about uh, tenants' rights, about illegal evictions, et cetera, et cetera. But if we won't represent in court and if it crosses over the boundary where it, we can see that a client needs a solicitor, we will say. Mm. But the initial steps we can help with. Wonderful. We've, 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 we've saved the best question to last uh, on the group chat. I'm just going to read it out um, as it is, because it's it's a wonderful note to, to end up on before we wrap okay. things up. Um, I suspect people may be reluctant to even ask for help, even with a support service such as Paperweight. How can we, here on the call, best promote your good work, 
can you provide any social media links on the chat or afterwards for us to retweet, for example? Thank you. Yes, we can. I can't do it on the chat, but I will do it afterwards. Absolutely. Um, I will make sure that um, I forward those because yes, that, that's great. And yes, you're right. It takes a lot of courage to take advice. It takes a lot of courage to admit that you have a problem. That is the beginning of the process. But you know, it, it, the hardest part is making that first call. Once you've done that, the rest falls into place. And just to say as well, it's not, you know, we, we take um, the, the initial information through email as well. So some people might be um, a bit hesitant or worried to kind of make that first phone call. They can email through to us um, and I'll put the email in the chat as well. Um, and then follow up with another phone call at a time that suits them or in a way that you know, suits them. Uh, Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're, we're closing in on the hour and we have some um, a fantastic presentation from you, Caroline, and wonderful contributions as well from Eve. I can't think of anything better to say than, than you guys are clearly doing God's work in my, in my humble opinion. Uh, but that said, uh, there's also the, the share team of volunteers, uh, the, the South Hampstead uh, office and the Rabon Rabonim obviously are always available to take calls. Just um, this last week, I've been peeing stuff to, to Ellie, and he's been amazing as well. Shlomo also. Um, and the address for that is um, on the share side of, of the volunteering is share at southhampstead.org. So it just leaves me to, to thank again, Caroline and me for, for the most wonderful presentations and contributions um, to raise the profile of this amazing charity. And also the, the South Hampstead office uh, for real leadership in distributing this, and in particular, Marcel and Joel, who've done so much to, to make this evening happen. So thank you all, and um, looking forward to the next one when it, when it comes. Thank you. And from me, a, a personal thank you for allowing us to present this evening. We hope that we can be of help to one person, if not every one person, but thank you very much, and thank you for all the great work you're doing too. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Thank you.